Hello, and welcome to episode 9 of Destroy Before Listening, which is a conversation between myself, Pete Byrne, and Che Lawrence. Che was a founding member of the band Tribute and came in as second guitarist for Bob Tilton, playing on their second 7 inch and first album Crescent, both released on Subjugation Records. He stayed with the band for around five years and left before their second album was released in 1999 on Southern Records. In 2012, after he lived in America for a number of years, Che played bass in the band Coffin Pricks. That group was short-lived and featured DC and Discord legend Chris Thompson. Unfortunately, there were only three tracks out there released on a 7-inch. This conversation covers the scene in the 90s, moving from the straight edge bands to the mid-decade heyday of UK hardcore. It's impossible at this point to not mention the term emo when talking about this stuff, as the music definitely became more melodic. Both the stories of Tribute and Bob Tilton are intertwined and talked about in depth. Che's experiences with writing, recording and playing gigs are all mentioned and a must hear for anyone interested in this era of music. Please subscribe and share this to anyone who may be interested. Getting the word out is always appreciated. There is an Instagram page you can follow also, which is at Destroy Before Listening. Thanks. You grew up in like a really like small village in, in Lincolnshire. Just, you know, how you came into music or contact with music or early experiences with that in a small community or a small area? Well, let me think. This is a long time ago. I'm like 46 now, so I'm just going to cast my mind back a long way. Yeah, so basically, uh, I just got into metal, really. I mean, basically, hardcore kids, in my experience, they're either hip-hop kids or they're metalheads, and they just kind of come together. But I was definitely a metalhead. Uh, I got into metal really young, and, you know, it's just like, I wanted the, the hardest and heaviest, basically, like, you know, young teenagers. And that was like searching out, you know, obscure thrash and that. And then I kind of got into crossover and like, you know, corrosion and conformity and DRI, that kind of stuff. And then just kind of going back from there and discovering punk bands and, you know, just kind of getting into that stuff. And around that time, I was hanging out with a bunch of metalheads. And then I kind of, Struck up a friendship with a bunch of uh, skater kids from the next village over. And these are like tiny little villages with like little cliques everywhere. Amongst that group was uh, Carl Broom, who was the singer in Tribute, and uh, Mark Hutchinson, who was the, the drummer in Tribute, and a bunch of other kids, cool kids. And they introduced me to a, a whole other bunch of stuff like, uh, you know, the Revelation stuff and uh, stuff like Sam I Am and all that kind of thing. And they already kind of had a band together. It was called Disbelief. It was kind of a stick of it all type thing. And then I kind of joined that on second guitar. Lee Wright was the other guitar player. And uh, we kept going for a while. And that band eventually kind of turned into what was basically tribute. How did you decide on playing guitar? Or when did you start playing guitar? Uh, I don't remember. I think it's when I was, when we were younger, my, my little brother wanted to, learn how to play guitar and since he got he got a cheap guitar and i was like all right i'll try it as well but i got bass so uh for a little while uh, i was playing bass and he was playing guitar and we were just like playing like you know noisy bonkers stuff in the garage he got bored playing guitar and i was like uh oh, i'll switch to guitar then so that was basically it i never really thought of myself as a musician I was just someone who had a guitar, basically, and I could strum out a few chords. It just kind of happened. So I started playing guitar when I was like probably 13, 14. I'm still not much better than I was back then, but uh, still do it. So that was basically, yeah, it wasn't really something I thought about. It was just kind of something that happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, what what year would uh, tribute be uh, an idea or something that you were all kind of like getting into, you know, we'll do, we'll do a band, take it seriously? I don't think we ever really took it seriously. It was just kind of something that we did because we lived in tiny little villages in Lincolnshire and there wasn't much to do. 
uh, yeah. especially in the dark evenings you couldn't you know you couldn't go skateboarding it's too dark the roads are terrible uh so we would just you know a couple of nights a week we would just uh band practice and uh carl's dad was in the building trade and he had a lock up down the back roads in Wapload, and we just used to hold up in there and make a ton of noise and it wasn't really i don't think we were thinking about playing gigs but disbelief kind of morphed into another band that weren't even called tribute for a while it was more it mm -hmm. was called house arrest which is like the worst yeah. band name ever <laughs> okay. i think we wanted to be citizens arrest at the time we were yeah, like yeah. listening to like citizens arrest and life's blood and born against yeah. and hell no and all that kind of stuff we wanted to get a bit more you know that kind of sound in and then maybe probably a year later we I think we put a we put a rehearsal tape together, and I think Carl gave it to Neil from Bob Tilton, who had just kind of started playing shows because we were into Downfall, of course, which is the band before Bob Tilton, and then they right. did the switch. And the first couple of shows with Bob Tilton, Carl hit him up with the tape. Neil liked the tape, and he put us on uh, at the Narrowboat in Nottingham, I think, and that would have been around ninety four, I think. Okay. 93, 94, I don't know. There's, there's, there's some tapes kicking around the internet of the, those shows. It was like really noisy and metallic back then, really, really distorted, uh, a lot different from what Tribute was. And then at some point in time, I think uh, Bob Tilton wanted to add a second guitar player and, and Neil asked me to join. So that kind of just, it just kind of happened organically. It wasn't really like we had a big plan. It just, you know, it was just being, being friendly. But contact i guess you traded uh music tapes and stuff i guess you got into some new music some new bands or like moss icon really or heroin or the, the kind of stuff the american stuff early 90s oh yeah i mean it was totally all about what was coming out of america at the time like i said because we like when I first joined their band Disbelief, it was like sick of it all. And then we started getting into like, you know, Born Against and Hell No and Life's Blood and that kind of thing. We were like, no, we're doing that now. And then a few years later, when we heard, uh, uh, I remember we went to a show uh, in Nottingham and uh, Simon from Tilton was doing his distro at the time. And I remember buying, I think it was the Indian Summer Current split. And I remember we got that home and we were like, bloody hell. <laughs> Yeah. This is this is this is it, and uh, I think overnight it was like ooh, we started grooving, moving towards that kind of sound, uh, and you know, Musk Icon especially that. But we didn't find out about Musk Icon because there's no internet back then until a little yeah. while after we found out about Indian Summer and Current, which were two bands you know that came after Musk Icon in the states. Yeah, it was just like we were sponges at the time, and we were just kind of soaking up as much as we could. So you were just kind of wanted to really emulate whatever you, you were all kind of vibing at the time or getting, the, getting into. That, that was pretty much it. I don't know if we were like, you know, we were like, oh, we got to copy what they're doing because this is the new cool thing. It was just like, we really like this music and we really want to be, you know, doing this kind of thing. We were just like really enthusiastic kids and we were like, you know, this is, this is really cool. And I think, you know, a lot of that stuff it still holds up today because it's like, you know, it's really unique, especially after, you know, if you've just been listening to, uh, you know, really noisy, distorted punk for the longest time. And then this stuff comes out of left field and it's like, what the fuck? You know, it's so it's, mm -hmm. it just kind of shook things up for us. And we were just kind of like, yeah, this is, this is really new and interesting. I want to, you know, we want to be a part of it. Yeah contemporaries wise who are the bands because there's it's kind of limited i suppose because you've got bob tilton and like schema and uh man ray as well they came along a little bit later there was uh initially there was there was uh bob tilton uh and they were we were like 40 miles down the road from nottingham so not only were we into bob tilton we you know every other saturday we would drive up to nottingham to go to the record shops there and you know, they had the best record shops within spitting distance from where we were. So we used to go there. Simon from Bob Tilton used to work at Selectisk. So, yeah. you know, you go in there and say, hello, what's up? What's good? So there was that relationship there as well. Also from up north, there was Dead Wrong. Uh, they were doing something really cool and unique, we thought. Uh, so we were really into Dead Wrong. 
but at the time it was just those two bands really and then it started to grow uh man ray grew out of a band called crossfire in leicester they were like they were a straight edge band uh and they just kind of stopped and then they started doing man ray i think the i can't remember the lineup uh glenn the singer was the same i can't remember the other guys in the band i think phil from schema was in the band schema also came out of another band who uh i've forgotten the name of now i'm sorry uh <laughs> but i think if i remember rightly they were kind of like a sam i am type band okay remember i saw them a few times really really young lads and also they were like you know when they when they gone into the whole uh what was happening in the emo scene sorry emo scene finger quotes they were you know they stopped what they were doing straight away and changed it to schema so mm -hmm. bands bands were like cropping up really thick and fast and also down south as well it was mostly uh straight edge bands uh fabric were fucking awesome in my opinion uh I, I love that band and what they were doing was still kind of like you know heavy but you know also bringing in uh kind of uh, a lot of new elements, progressive elements and stuff. So yeah, I love what they were doing. I understand as well, they were great, a great live band. Yeah, you could go on and on about, uh, you know, bands that were popping up back, uh, back in the day. I can't think of like too much before it really. I mean, well, there's, there seems to be a, a gap maybe of like three, four years before there's kind of, you know, the, there's the eighties, the grind core thing. Mm -hmm. And then new new nineties bands happening. It, it is kind of odd, really. I mean, you, you look at you know the UK hardcore scene and you know the the heyday back at the eight, late eighties, like you know Heresy and Ripcord and that kind of thing. And then it kind of yeah, you're right. It kind of dies down a little bit, and everyone just there's a ton of straight edge bands, and there's some really good ones, but there's a lot of really boring ones, and that kind of went on for a few years, and then. Uh, yeah, it it just kind of exploded again. I think when everyone, I don't want to say got into what was you know the the, the new sound that was coming out on the other side of the the Atlantic, but it, it kind of did in a way. Uh, a lot of bands just kind of got into it at the same time and uh, were doing their own you know version of that kind of sound. Well, yeah. When did you decide to record a, a demo or like where you, where you would record a demo and? how you would uh, get it out there, not distribute it. I don't think it was actually a real demo demo. I think it was uh, more of like a rehearsal tape uh, that we used. It was on a boom box, probably in Carl's dad's lockup. Uh, so it, was, it wasn't really, it wasn't really high, high quality. And I don't think it's like, you know, on Discogs or anything like that. Cause I don't think we ever sold it. I think we just kind of gave it to people to say like, Hey, okay. we're a band, put us on maybe. And that, that's kind of how we got got the name about out and about really. And then I think we just got uh, from getting put on in Nyam. I think the word got around and we got put on in Bradford. And then when I think we got we got put on in Bradford, Ian and Helen from Subjugation were like, "Hey, we, uh, you want to do something?" And we were like, "Sure." And then we recorded a real demo for Subjugation which was sold. And I think, uh, I think we recorded a few tracks and I think some of them went on the demo and one of them went on a flexi disc for how we rock. And then, and then I think after that, maybe a few, six months, a year after that, we did a, a seven inch that came out in subjugation. So I think that's the timeline. I'm not sure. <laughs> Cause you recorded I like Andy Sneepers credited. Oh, he did, he's yeah. Recording those because he's like, does he play guitar for Judas Priest now? He he does, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think he. Yeah, yeah. It, it's crazy. Back in the day, I remember uh, we were like, where are we going to record this? And I think I think Neil from Tilton was like, you should go with Andy Sneap because uh, he knew Andy because he's from Nottingham and Andy's from Nottingham and uh, Andy, of course, was the guitar player in uh, Sabbath. Uh, the English Sabbat, not the Japanese Sabbat. And they did a few albums uh, for Noise and they were pretty good. I, I liked uh, Sabbat. Uh, so yeah, we were like, sure, we'll give it a go. And he, his studio at the time was like in a little lockup on the outskirts of Nottingham. It was a tiny little place. We recorded that first. Sorry, is that backstage? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what he was called. Right. 
I don't remember though. I honestly don't remember, but I, I, I do remember it was just like a little lock up and we were just kind of, you know, sitting outside and on the gravel drive talking about stuff. And the, the control room was like tiny. And then the live room was just like a little concrete bunker. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was cool because, you know, back then, you know, he wasn't, didn't have a name room staff as a producer at all. He was just like recording us all day for like 150 quid or something. And now he's like, uh, super metal producer it's like done all this cool stuff and you know really invented you know the the modern metal guitar sound with a you know sticking a tube screamer in front of a in front of a pv and all that so yeah i mean he's done some great stuff back then he was no one and he he told me that my guitar sound sucked <laughs> which i found really offensive at the time but he was completely right it did it was awful yeah was that a a track studio was it his gear or something I think I think it was. Uh, I think what happened is after Sabat, I, I might be wrong here, but I think uh, after that finished, he was like, oh, "I'm gonna, you know, learn about uh, producing," and he he went to school for producing. And this setup he had was the first thing he did. I think he was probably recording in practice spaces in Nottingham, but he had like a sixteen track desk, I think. And I remember he was recording to ADATs. Uh, so it was like a, it was a little a little digital setup that was uh, you know pretty pretty standard for back in those days. Oh, very cool. So is this where you recorded like subsequent uh, tribute recordings then, or the, like the, the seven inch? No, I think uh, we did we did that. We did the first demo there, and then I think we came back again for the seven inch on subjugation, and then. For the last single, we went to uh, a place that was actually l local to us that we'd never heard of before that uh, I've forgotten the name of. It was uh, near Whiz Beach uh, that I actually liked a lot better. Yeah, we were actually planning on doing a, a tenant or an album or something for Tribute, and it just Tribute just kind of fizzled out before that happened. But uh, we were going to go back to that studio. All right, we did, this would be the... I think that's my favorite tribute song is the last it's on the split seven inch with uh beacon the thing that spread put out yeah i think that was uh i think we did that song and the last seven inch at the same time but don't quote me on that but i think we did uh yeah it was uh the, yeah the sound was getting a bit different and uh the songs were getting longer uh we had a we had a bunch of stuff that we didn't end up recording because it just Tribute just kind of fizzled out because I had moved down south, uh, Carl had moved down south. Uh, the band just kind of went its separate ways, which is kind of the same thing that happened with Tilton, really. Uh, but yeah, it was just just one of those sad things that uh, you know a lot, a lot of songs just went down the drain because we uh, just didn't record them. Yeah, it was like it kind of reminded us it's more of a split lip. Or something or like that, that, that kind of like more melodic hardcore it's at the time i suppose when it came out because it probably came out a bit after you recorded it anyway i'd imagine yeah yeah no uh, yeah at the time i think we were definitely kind of into that kind of like split lip chamberlain type sound and making you know and not doing so much of the quite a bit loud bit quite a bit loud bit thing just kind of mm -hmm. trying to be a bit more straight ahead rock uh so yeah, I think I think that was definitely there, and it was definitely a conscious effort to make it different from Bob Tilton because uh, I, at that time I was in two bands. I was in Bob Tilton and Tribute, and I wanted them to be very distinct, you know, not not doing the same thing. So people said, "Oh, all this stuff sounds the same." No, but uh, so yeah, yeah, it was definitely moving in a different direction. Yeah. So you're doing a uh, tribute, and at what point do you join Bob Tilton, or, or what year is the sort of transition i think it, it's a it's a weird story as well uh okay go ahead <laughs> no not not that weird it just seems weird weird to me looking back the funny thing is so we we got a gig uh like i said carl gave neil i think the 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 demo tape and he put us on a supporting someone at the, the narrow boat in lincoln and uh it went really well and then i think a little while after that, we went to see Quicksand in Nottingham, and they, it was a really weird show. And they weren't playing upstairs at, 
the Rock City in Nottingham. They were playing the bar at Rock City in Nottingham, which is a much smaller place. And not only were they playing the bar at Rock City in Nottingham, they were supporting an ACDC covers band at the bar at Rock City. So it was a really weird gig. Here we are watching Quicksand. They were fantastic. Uh, afterwards, this ACDC cover band comes on. I remember Neil and Carl were, were, were gabbing. Uh, they both come over to me. They're like, Hey, do you want to play second guitar in Tilton? And at that stage, I've only seen Tilton like a couple of times because they haven't played out that much. And I was like, uh, yeah, just kind of freaking out because I thought Tilton were the, were the shit at the time. So I went down there for a couple of practices and this was the time in my life where, you know, I just, you know, done my A-levels. I ended up going to university for like three weeks and telling Tilton, I'm sorry, I'm going to give it a university. You know, so and I come back and uh, I'm living with my, with my folks, really a bit sorry for myself because, you know, I'm feeling like a bit of an idiot. And I remember I didn't I didn't call like Neil to say I'm back or anything. I was just like sitting there feeling miserable and Tilton were playing a gig. So, you know, me and Carl, we went to we went to go see Tilton. And I remember Neil saying, what, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I dropped out of university. And Neil was like, you didn't you didn't call or anything. I was like, well, I was, I was a bit embarrassed. <laughs> and he's like, get back in the band, you idiot. So uh, and I think during this time, they'd actually recorded the first seven inch, I think. So I wasn't on the first seven inch because I because I was being an idiot. Uh, but then from that point on, I was back in the band. And this would have been about ninety six, no ninety five, I think. Uh, and so from that point, uh, I was in the band through to about ninety nine, I think. This was about 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 five years. I le- only left the band because. I really went to university at that stage. I got into uh, St. Martin's in London. So uh, I, I moved down there and just traveling back and forth to get a band practice has become untenable. So uh, that's the reason I dropped out. Yeah, because I mean, you wouldn't all be like Nottingham based at that point, would you? For a little while I was in Lincoln, uh, not, not Hull Beach. Uh, which which made it a little bit easier, I think, because Lincoln's a little closer than Nottingham. Maybe not, I don't remember. But uh, yeah, everyone in Tilton, at least, was starting to spread out. Mark had gone to university and he was in Leeds. Uh, yeah, the rest of the guys are in Nottingham. I, I was moving around all over the place. So it was just kind of hard to get together. Eventually, I was like, you know, this, this isn't really working anymore. I gotta, I gotta go. And then Ralph came in to replace me. And I think the band kind of picked up again after that because, uh, you know, they got, they got together more often. Uh, and then the second album came out. Yeah. That was a, a while there. Like, you know, it's 97, 98 where we had a lot of, we had a lot of songs for the second album, but they just weren't getting recorded because we couldn't finish it off. So it was just like a proximity thing. The reason for you, uh, I suppose, stopping doing uh, playing guitar on that band. Yeah, it was just kind of, I think at the time when I moved down south, I was living in Maidstone. So moving between Maidstone and Nottingham for band practice, yeah, yeah not not really going to happen. So, uh, yeah. And it's the same thing with, uh, with Tribute. Uh, Carl had also moved to London, I think, to go to... Uh, to go to university. So it's just for both of those bands, it was just, you know, getting everyone in the same location just to do what the bands are supposed to do. It's just become so difficult. The bands stopped being bands. Yeah. So was it at the second uh, Bob Tilton seven inch where you kind of, you were all like pretty focused on a common goal or whatever for like a, a direction? I think at the time, Bob Tilton was changing as well because if you listen to that really early stuff, uh, and that never really came out. There's there's a demo tape that was going around. Uh, it was never sold. I don't think it was more kind of traded. And one of those songs is on the CD version of the Southern first album as a as a hidden track. Okay. I think if you if you reverse the CD from the very first track, you'll find it. Yeah, it was it was a lot harder. It was more kind of like you know born against type sound, uh, 
uh, when, when Tilton first started, and it just kind of softened up as things went by. Uh, the first seven inch is still quite hard, uh, but the second seven inch is, is a lot, you know, quieter. I think and more melodic. I can't remember. Where we, I think we recorded that. Uh, oh, I forgot the name of the place. It's totally gone. Anyway, I'm sure it's on the internet. I know there's, there's backstage. That's why I mentioned it before. That's uh, that's a credit on. Um, well, that might be that seven inch. That might be. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I think it's the same guy. It was like a Western Supermare or something like that. Oh, okay. okay. Is that uh, White House? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. The place where that's where a lot of bands recorded there, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. We went there because, you know, the, you know, a lot of UK bands were going in there. Like, I think Jail Star Recipes and God knows who else went there, but it was a really popular place. Uh, yeah, so so we went there. We went there for a weekend to record that seven inch, and then I don't think anyone was too happy with it. So I think every after that, everything was recorded by uh, you know Mark Sims, uh, the bass player, on a, on a variety of uh, borrowed and uh, you know and manufactured re- equipment. Yeah, did you did or did the band record the album then? Yeah, yeah. The the al- the first album, uh, Crescent was uh, entirely recorded by Mark. And most of it was recorded in uh, an abandoned house, I think. I think there was this house that was like an ex-rental. Uh, I, can't, I just remember, all I remember is sitting in a freezing cold abandoned house and we were recording the guitar parts. It was a very, very strange experience. <laughs> was this, uh, so this was in Leeds? No, nah, this was in Nottingham. Oh, this is in Nottingham, um, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we recorded that. We knocked it out pretty quickly because we were in this house, and I don't know if we were supposed to be there or not. Mm-hmm. So I, I remember that much. Uh, yeah, that, we remember when we knocked it out pretty quickly, and uh, I'm just trying to think of anything else about that. I really don't remember much of recording that for, for some reason, which is kind of odd oh, because it's probably the longest thing we recorded up until that stage. Yeah. What was the equipment you recorded on? I think there was like a Tascam 8-track that we'd borrowed from someone and a, a variety of mics that we'd borrowed and some cheap mixing desk. I, I don't remember. I would say reach out, reach out to Mark if you want the particulars. I'm sure he'll be happy to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I don't remember much about it other than uh, sitting in a, a, a cold, empty, empty house. And we're just kind of sitting in there with our woolly hats on and just trying to knock it out as quickly as possible. Oh, uh easily did those songs come together when you were like practicing them and or working out parts and things like that because it's quite uh you know it's quite dynamic it's like and intricate as well you know and, like, the sort of stuff you were listening to or whatever or the, the the influences most of the bob tilton stuff back then was coming from neil uh i would I would come to band practice and uh, he was like the guy coming up with like 99% of the music. So he would come up with a riff and start playing it and we would just kind of jam along with it. And most of the time he would say, Jay, I want you to play this over it. Uh, Sometimes he wouldn't and I'd make up my own stuff. But really uh, it was mostly just, you know, coming directly from Neil. And Simon would, would have like a notebook that was like full of lyrics that he'd been working on and he would find something that would kind of come together. So I remember I remember back in the day when we first got together as a five piece, everything was coming together really quickly. Uh, it was just kind of, you know, a lot of music was coming out. I think uh, t- towards the end of the band, we kind of maybe got a bit of a, a creative block, but that was probably due to the fact that we just had a hard time getting into the same room as one another on a regular basis. Yeah. Was there... The Peel session is 1995 as well, isn't it? So you, what were your experiences with that? There was this weird period uh, just after this, the second 7-inch came out, uh, which you probably read about, uh, that where the enemy took it and made it single of the week. And that was really bizarre because n- none of us like you know, were reading the enemy at the time. I mean, back, back in the day, there was like, you know, there used to be like three uh weekly you know music newspapers in the uk there was like uh, melody maker and what was the other one sounds and uh, enemy and you know on that list the enemy was my least favorite and so when they were like you know made us uh 
you know, single of the week. I was like, what, the, what the hell? Who is this? And, uh, it turns out it's this young lady called Angela, I think was the reporter's name. She was, she was a nice, nice young lady and she'd heard it and she was really genuinely enthusiastic about us. Uh, so, I mean, she came down to an old day at the one in 12 in, you know, Bradford just to see us. I think we told her we were playing this old day, you know, the one in 12 just to see how interested she was. And she actually came all the way up to Bradford for this, you know, all day at the, at the one in 12, which is like outside of her comfort zone. So we, we were kind of impressed by that. She was like, Oh, you know, so this isn't, this isn't just be She genuinely is interested. So, so that was an interesting experience. So I think on the back of that, uh, the Peel session just kind of happened. Uh, I mean, Peel, I think had, had played us before that happened. But he'd also played as after, so I mean, whenever I heard that you know John Peel had played as, I was like over the moon. And getting asked to do a Peel session was like was like crazy because you know I grew up listening to Peel, and you know my record collection was full of those you know Strange Fruit tw- twelve inches with the you know the Peel sessions and whatnot from various different bands. So it was like for that to happen, it was like whoa, cool. Uh, and I still remember going down to Made of Ale to the studio. And just feeling absolutely petrified. Uh, this is the this huge sound room. And I remember the day Neil, Neil and I were having such a hard time tuning our, our matching SGs that we just couldn't get them in tune. And we were just like, fuck, we're doing a peel session. We just can't tune our guitars. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, no, it was great totally surreal we had to be there at the crack of dawn and it's a really really big building uh, like you know you walk through corridors and corridors and go past these big auditoriums where you know for like recording orchestras and whatnot uh i think we were there on a sunday and it was dead quiet we were like a huge building we were the only people in it and uh there was like a, an engineer and his assistant and they just said set up and we set up in the corner of this huge room and they put some baffles up and we just belted everything out live. And uh, that was it. We just cranked the songs out and then they mixed the songs and then they told us to get out. And then it was on the radio. It was uh, it was a really surreal experience. Yeah, well, that's cool. With regard to um, like the gigs you're playing or uh, how much in by way of touring or playing gigs because you're in a, like it's a pretty good position, isn't it? Nottingham for playing like south really anywhere from like london up to manchester you know i know for sure because you know we were right there on the m1 we played most places within within reason you know i remember we we went up to scotland a a couple of times south coast a couple of times but really if we could keep it to the midlands you know the more the better I remember we all, you know, because we all had jobs and whatnot. So not, we would get back and then just drive to wherever we needed to be and get up the next morning and go to the job. I remember coming back home a few times and getting home from like a, you know, some distant gig at 4 a.m. in the morning and then getting up at like five because I was a, I was a postman at the time and I had to, so uh, it was, yeah, kind of, kind of strenuous, but uh yeah, no, we, we we played pretty much everywhere except, you know, if it was getting too far afield. Uh, we didn't tour that much. I think we we did a like a little tour with Fabric once, just kind of a jaunt around the country. Uh, I remember doing that. That was fun. And then we went to Belgium once, and then we did a, like a little jaunt around Sweden and Norway. But yeah, not really, not really any touring as such, because like I said uh half the band had serious jobs that they needed to they needed to be present at yeah i suppose a bit difficult if you're not a london band because you never moved to london or we were kind of lucky i suppose because we we were kind of like treading the treading two sides of the line at one point because we had we would go up up north and do do punk all day as a, you know the one in 12 or you know some squat in leeds or whatnot and then we'll go down to london and there would be like some you know north london indie Promote was all day, uh, and then there would be a totally different crowd, you know, not at all, not at all punky, more kind of just like, you know, London indie. Uh, so it was just kind of t- in two camps at once. So it was, uh, it was, it was fun there for a while that uh, we, we were kind of bridging the gap, which uh, I think a, a lot of people in the punk scene weren't too, weren't too happy about at the time. 
I think I think the thing is we never said no to anyone really. Uh, so I think we were always if people seemed genuine and they were doing it because of the love of the music, we were happy to support them. So we never really sold out or anything like that. It was all merely to do with the fact that we just kind of wanted to support people who were doing something that we thought was cool. And whether that was like a a punk squat in Leeds or whether it was like a, you know, uh, an indie promoter in London, it's all all the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. You know, you you mentioned the kind of parting ways and like not having time to focus on either tribute or Bob Tilton and just, uh, what it's become and looking back over it and you know with the talk of uh race use and whatnot just like thoughts thinking back or looking back to those times i think it's cool i think if people are still into that stuff i, I think that's really cool uh and i'm not precious about the past at all you know i don't i don't think we need to protect it or whatnot i i mean i, I think if people are still into it and they want to keep putting it out and uh, doing reissues and whatnot it's fine by me, but uh, I don't really think a lot about the past, and you know, and uh, do a lot of gatekeeping about you know who's who can listen to it, and you know, you weren't there at the time, so you know, that that kind of stuff. I think if kids kids get into it these days, that's that's cool too. But uh, yeah, I've always I've always been like you know moving on to the next thing, and I haven't really done much post uh, you know. Nothing on the same level as Bob Tilton, but I've always just kind of, you know, been interested in, in hearing new music and uh, getting involved in new things. And uh, so, yeah, I don't I don't spend too much time looking back, I suppose. Okay. Probably about like five years ago or maybe like less than that. I was like looking at uh, the Chris Thompson discography and I saw this band Coffin Pricks. And I was like, what the fuck, you know, coffin pricks. I mean, I haven't heard of this. And then even more bizarrely, I saw that it was your name, Che Lawrence, as guitarist. And I was also confused because I remembered that name from Bob Tilton and Tribute and how that came about for you or why, why you'd, well, obviously, why wouldn't you want to do that? It, it was a weird one for sure, though, because uh, Chris... Chris has lived in, well, he doesn't live here anymore. He lives in San Francisco, I think, at the moment. Uh, but he was living in Chicago for the longest time. I think after he finished, because he was at university in Wisconsin, at the University of Madison, where, while he was doing Circus Lupus stuff. I think he did a degree in marketing or something. Or Anyway, he got, he got a job down in Chicago working for an advertising company, and he was doing pretty well. And I think at the time he was doing Red Eyed Legends. I didn't know Chris at all. I, you know, I've seen Chris at shows. You know, I'd gone to see gone to see Chris bands back in the day. Uh, I always liked his vocals, yeah. but I'd never met him. I didn't didn't know him at all. Uh, my friend Jeff, uh, who folks might know, he's a he's a drummer singer. He was in you know, Ottawa, uh, I think most famously, but he's been in a shit ton of other bands. Jeff's a lovely guy. Uh, we were in a band together briefly before the Coffin Pricks, and we were just having lineup issues. We had a few bunch of songs, but we just couldn't get like the rest of the band together. And in the end, we just gave up. And Ryan, who was the guitar player in Coffin Pricks, he was trying to get Coffin Pricks side. He was looking for a drummer. He asked Jeff. They were looking for a bass player. Jeff says, I know a guy. He mentions my name. Uh, and that just kind of came together like that. They, they went through a couple of different bass players, uh, and uh, eventually they asked me, and I kind of stuck. But uh, yeah, it just kind of came out of the blue, really. They, they asked Jeff out of the blue, and then by extension of Jeff, they asked me. So it just kind of it just kind of happened, and all of a sudden I was in a band again. But that was another band that we had. We had a ton of songs with Coffin Bricks, and the only thing that's out there is one seven inch. Uh, we had an album's worth of stuff we could have recorded, but it just kind of fell apart. It's one of those bands that just kind of fell apart really quickly and a little bit acrimoniously. But uh, but yeah, it was fun while it lasted. Coffin Pricks was totally Ryan. Uh, Ryan, the guitar player, Ryan Weinstein, uh, great guitar player, nice guy. Uh, uh, it was all him. He was he wrote, he wrote all the music for that band. Uh, so yeah, there wasn't me at all. I can't claim any credit. He was like, "Here's a riff, play bass, bam, there we go." So I mean, I, I never really played. 
I mean, I'd always, always play bass on the side, but I never really played bass in a band. So, but yeah, no, it was fun. It was kind of, I, you know, honestly, I liked it because I didn't have to write anything. You know, when you're in a band, sometimes you go to band practice and the band all looks at you and like, you got any riffs? And you're like, no. <laughs> so, you know, in, in Coffin Bricks, that never happened because, uh, you know, so I was more, definitely more of the side man even more of a side man than I was in, you know, in Bob Tilton where Neil wrote most of the stuff. I, in Coffin Bricks, it was totally all Ryan. Yeah. Is that the sort of uh, your role that you just kind of accepted, really, that you were a guy who was going to play guitar? Honestly, I, I don't care. I mean, I think, you know, the the band I had the most input in was probably Tribute. Uh, I, I was, like, writing... You know, I think I was probably writing about 80, 89 percent of the music in tribute, and then Tilton. It was mostly Neil with some contributions from me, and like you know, Coffee Pricks later, Tony Ryan, and I'm fine with it either way because, like I said, I'm not. I don't really. I never really felt myself as a musician, so I don't really have any kind of wounded ego about you know not being able to express myself because it's just you know. I'm just a guy with a guitar. I can turn up and I can play <laughs> play what you want me to play or I can play my own stuff. I don't care, whatever. So it's just like, I'm, do, I'm just happy to be there, honestly. It's just like going, going to a space with a bunch of friends, drinking a beer or two, hanging out, shooting the shit. You know, that's probably, I probably enjoy that more than, you know, anything else about being in a band. I've never really had any kind of dreams to, you know, get signed to a major or, you know, go on some massive tour or, you know, put out a ton of records. It's more about just kind of hanging out for me, I guess. Mm-hmm. 